Well, welcome to lesson number five. Let's uh, take our Bibles and uh, turn to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, the lesson tonight is Faith That Pursues, and we're continuing to kind of deal with the question, if it's God's will to heal, and we've already dealt with that, it's God's will to heal, then why uh, do we experience uh, people not getting healed when we pray for them? And uh, we're going to look at the the subject of faith tonight and there is an aspect of faith that we talked about the nature of the kingdom last week and the nature of the kingdom is it is at hand repent for the kingdom is at hand and uh, the tension there is yes it's at hand and available but yet it's going to be fully realized at a later time and so we have that tension that we have to wrestle with uh, there's also a tension uh, with the nature of faith which we'll get to in just a moment but what I want to ask us tonight is, what kind of faith is Jesus looking for? And what kind of faith does he want us to have? In the midst of juggling the tension that exists between the kingdom being at hand and the kingdom being fully realized at a future time, what kind of faith should we have right now? And the story of four friends who bring a paralytic to, uh, to Jesus to uh, have Jesus heal their friend uh, reveals a number of uh, lessons about the kind of faith that I think uh, Jesus wants us to have. And so let's look at the uh, passage of Scripture, Mark chapter 2. We'll read verses uh, 1 to 12, but the focus of our, of our attention is really just going to be on the first five verses, but we'll read the whole story. And so it says this, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and Jesus preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him uh, because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, and in your own Bibles or perhaps in the study guide, I think the reference is there, just circle that. When he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. So there's quite a bit happening in this story. And and one of the reasons I think Jesus proclaimed this man's forgiveness was to demonstrate his divine nature because they said, who can forgive sins but God alone? And uh, Jesus, I, I think, just kind of did that on purpose so that he would reveal himself and his divine nature to them. Of course, their hardened and, their heart and hearts uh, weren't able to see that. But with these four friends, we have a great example of the kind of faith that Jesus sees. It says, when he saw their faith, and that's important. Faith is something that Jesus Christ can see. There was action and activity that corresponded to their faith that Jesus saw, and then he honored it and rewarded it. And so we're going to describe the faith of these four friends tonight. And the first thing that I want us to uh, notice, and this is the first fill in the blank, uh, is their faith was determined. Their faith was determined. The text says, when they heard... Uh, that Jesus was in town. It says some men came bringing to him a, a paralytic carried by for them. And so they were determined to get their friend to Jesus. So when they heard that Jesus was back home in Capernaum, they were determined to get their friend to see him, no matter how difficult it would be. Difficult being your second fill in the blank. So they were determined to get him to Jesus, no matter how difficult it would be. Jesus, by this time, already had a reputation for healing people. And he already had a prayer meeting at this home, Peter's uh, mother-in-law's home, where people came to him all night long and he healed their sick. 
And so he's back in town again, and they heard uh, that he was back in town. And these four men bring to Jesus uh, their friend, and they carried him on a mat. Now, what's interesting in the determination that they had, it's not like today where if we hear Jesus is in Wyerton or in uh, Sable Beach, we can get in our car, drive down there, and be there in a relatively short amount of time and relatively easily. Uh, but in that day, they didn't really have the ability to do that. Now, we don't know how far they had to walk. We don't know how much this person would have weighed, but if it was an average weight. You could say maybe 150 to 170 pounds if he was a man, which he was. And they had to carry him. And so uh, this wasn't an easy thing to do. That's the point. Their faith was determined. They were going to get their friend to Jesus. They heard the stories of those who were healed uh, by, by Jesus. And so whatever it took, they got him there. They obviously didn't have a way to get them by a camel or horse, whatever. They decided to carry him. And just kind of speculate um, how many kilometers perhaps they walked as they carried him. This wasn't going to necessarily be easy, uh, but they did it because they loved their friend. They wanted to see him well. Okay? Uh, but when they got there, uh, there was a problem. And Steve Long, in his book, The Faith Zone, great book, I recommend that uh, everyone get a copy of that and read it. But in The Faith Zone, uh, Steve Long always says, and you can see this pattern in the Bible, that whenever God gives us hope, whenever God gives us an idea, and we begin to put it into action, we're always going to run into a problem that will test our faith. So these guys get the idea, Jesus is in town, let's get our friend to go and and, uh, and meet with Jesus, and Jesus will heal him. They start carrying him, but when they get to the house, they run into a problem. And, and oftentimes, our faith has to pass a test. We'll often run into obstacles when God puts something in our hearts, and we pursue it by, uh, by faith. And so when they get to the house, the Bible says in the Gospel that there were so many people uh, gathered, verse 2, uh, that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And so... These were small homes that they lived in, and so the house was crowded with people, and the outside, you can just try and imagine in your mind, uh, the outside was, the house would have been surrounded by people, the door would have been completely blocked, and uh, people are pressing toward the, the, the house to hear what Jesus is saying, okay? This is the kind of uh, atmosphere that they came into, and it, it would be very chaotic, because uh, people are wanting to hear Jesus, people are wanting to see Jesus. And, and they're pressing in. And so they get there, and there's, there's a problem. Now, if they didn't have strong faith or strong determination, they could have just said to their friend, well, we got to the meeting too late. Uh, there's no, no seats left, and it's too crowded. Jesus isn't going to have enough time for us, etc., etc. There was There was issues they, they had to deal with. Okay, And so point number two is that uh, their faith was overcoming. They weren't going to let a problem get in the way. They're, they're going to push through the problem. Their faith was overcoming. They were not going to let this problem get in the way of getting their friend to see the Lord. And so one definition of overcoming is to succeed in dealing with the problem. When you've overcome, you have succeeded uh, in dealing with the problem. And when God gives us hope, and we put that hope into action, and we start walking by faith according to the hope that God has given us, we will encounter problems. And our determination and our faith will push through those, and Jesus will, Jesus will notice that. He, he saw all of this. Okay? And so the definition of overcoming is to succeed in dealing with a problem. These four had a problem to deal with, and they overcame it. They could have easily said, it looks like we didn't get here on time, as I already mentioned. They, there was all kinds of reasons why they, they, sh they could have just said, sorry, let's go home, we'll try again tomorrow, but they didn't. And so what do you do when you can't get your friend in to the door, or you can't get to a window? I, you can just imagine this, they might have had to have actually like climbed on the people and kind of had people boost them up to get up to the roof. And so 
Uh, not only was their faith determined, and not only was their faith overcoming, they ran into a problem, they analyzed the situation, we're going to get him in there, somehow we've got to get him in here, let's get him on the roof. And, uh, and then they start digging the roof out. Now, imagine if this was your house, okay? Like, they're not thinking of, they're damaging somebody's property, they're thinking of, we just have to get our friend to Jesus no matter what, Right? I wouldn't tear a hole in the roof of somebody's house myself. I wouldn't think I would. But if I was desperate and I knew Jesus was there and I knew what Jesus could do, then perhaps that would change. But see, there's all kinds of reasons to justify why we maybe shouldn't do this. But they somehow get up onto the roof. We don't know how. I think they probably obviously had the help of the crowd. They get up onto the roof. And so this demonstrates another thing that Jesus saw, that their faith was persistent. It was persistent. They refused to give up and did whatever it took to get their friend to see Jesus. Although they ran into complications, they persevered until they got what they came for, in getting their friend to have a meeting with Jesus Christ. And so the point of the whole story with respect to Jesus saw their faith, is that Jesus honored faith when he saw it in action. Faith in the New Testament is an action word. It's a verb, and, and it's an action word. And faith is something that other people are supposed to see and hear. They're supposed to be able to uh, witness our faith. We're supposed to provide evidence of the faith that we have by the things that we say and by the things that we do. That's the nature of biblical faith. It's, it's something that can be seen and heard. Okay? And so Jesus honored their faith when he saw it in action. And then in Luke chapter 18, if you want to take your Bibles there, we're talking about the kind of faith that Jesus is looking for. He's looking for faith that's determined. He's looking for faith that overcomes. He's looking for faith that is persistent, that won't give up, that will encounter the obstacles and just, and just figure out a way of, of pressing through. And in Luke chapter 18, Jesus teaches a parable. And in the parable, uh, he is teaching the disciples uh, to pray and never give up. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. To pray and never give up. I've heard people say, you know, don't bother the Lord. You ask once, you ask twice, ask a few times. That he's heard your request, don't bother Him anymore. Uh, that's, that's not persistent faith, is it? Um, and so look, listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 18. Uh, Jesus told His disciples a parable to show them that they should, and circle this in your Bibles, always pray and never give up. Always pray, never give up. This is the kind of attitude that we have to have when we seek God's kingdom. It's at hand and it's available. There will be times when we don't experience it as we are seeking God for it. We've all had that experience. We've had people stay sick. We've had people die. We've had unanswered prayer. But Jesus is saying in this parable that he teaches... That our attitude should be, keep going for it. Keep asking God to move. Keep asking for God's kingdom to come. Don't give up in the pursuit, in other words. Always pray, never give up. Never draw the conclusion that God doesn't want to give the kingdom. Just keep going for it, no matter what's going on. And so it goes on to say, uh, Jesus said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? 
And notice the duration there. It's day and night, meaning that there are going to be times when we pursue God for an answer that's going to span a season. It's not always going to be instantaneous. It'll be crying out to Him day and night, crying out day and night. I tell you, uh, uh, Jesus said, will He keep putting them off? I tell you, He will see that they get justice in quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? So He's talking about His return in the interim between uh, Him ascending and His return. When I come... Am I going to find a church that pursues me with this kind of faith? That always prays and never gives up. Never gives up praying, never gives up praying for what we're asking for. Am I going to find this kind of faith when I return? It's an open-ended question. The answer is up to you and me. Right? And so, there's a few lessons that we, we learn uh, from this parable about praying and never give up. And don't miss the question that Jesus posed at the end. When I return, will I find this kind of faith? So it, it, the implication is that Jesus is looking for this kind of faith. A faith that prays, never gives up. So, can you see the kind of faith that Jesus is looking for? The kind of faith He is looking for is a faith that pursues God and doesn't give up in the pursuit. It won't give up. <coughs> Now let's be honest, sometimes we do give up. In the New Testament, when the angel appeared to Zechariah to announce the birth of John the Baptist, the angel Gabriel said, the prayer that you've prayed has been heard. But the tense in the Greek indicates that it was a prayer that he had prayed, that he had basically stopped praying. It was like past tense. But even then, God had honored that prayer and heard it. But Jesus wants us to have a kind of prayer life that always asks, never gives up. Never gives up until the need is met. Never gives up until the answer comes. Not to stop in the interim. The point of the parable is to show us the kind of faith he wants us to have. A faith that always prays. Always seeks God for his kingdom. And never gives up. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. This kind of seeking and praying, always pray, never give up, is described as crying out to God day and night in the parable, right? In Luke 18, verse 7. Will God not bring justice to His chosen ones who cry out to Him day and night? There's an impassioned uh, cry that Jesus is talking about. It's not just a simple prayer. It's an impassioned cry. And then in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, I think the reference is written in your study guide. This is the way that Jesus himself prayed. He was an impassioned person who prayed to God and cried out to God and uh, sought God's face. And in Hebrews 5, verse 7, it says this. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions. How? With loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he, God, heard him because of his reverent submission. So Jesus prayed with passion. He, there's an implication there of a desperation for God to intervene. And for God to be involved in, in our lives. It wasn't, you know, it was passionate. There was a fire there. There, there, was, there was a longing there, a yearning there for God uh, to come and to intervene. And so just as Jesus said, will he deny justice to his chosen ones who cry out day and night? Jesus himself, Hebrews 5 verse 7, uh, cried out to God uh, often with uh, petitions and loud cries and tears. And so here's uh, kind of the point from the Hebrews passage that Jesus Christ wants us to pursue God with all our hearts and not give up. This is the kind of faith that God sees, that God rewards, and that God is looking for. This is the kind of faith that God sees and rewards and is looking for. 
So ask yourself the question, am I praying like that? Am I asking God to meet my need like that? Am I crying out to God passionately, even in tears sometimes, because of how desperate I am for Him to move in the situation that I am wanting His kingdom to be manifested in? Always pray, never give up. Always seek. When God gives hope, put your faith in action. And that's why we preach the gospel. We don't just pray for people to get saved. We have to preach the gospel to them. We have to put our faith in action. And there's, you're going to run into a problem when you go and preach to your family. Or you're going to run into a problem when you go to preach to your unsaved friends. They might tell you off and, and, and tell you where to go and how to get there. And you're telling them how not to go there and not, how, how not to get there. All right? So you're going to run into a problem, but our faith has to be put in action. And, and what Jesus is saying in these verses and what he saw in these four friends was just a passionate determination to get their friend there. He taught us to pray with passion and cry out. Jesus himself cried out uh, and offered prayers and petitions with loud cries. And so this is the kind of faith that we're supposed to have. And so we need to take an honest evaluation of our prayer life and go, am I praying with passion like that? It's the kind of uh, faith that God sees, rewards, and is looking for. So I uh, want to transition to talk about the nature of faith. Each and every one of us has faith. Jen and I were having a conversation just as you guys were uh, on your way about, you know, faith the size of a mustard seed and God's desire for that mustard seed to grow into a large tree, right? For our faith to grow. And, but we need to talk about the nature of faith, the way that faith is. We talked about the nature of the kingdom. One of the reasons why uh, we don't see healing take place is, is the nature of the kingdom. It's at hand now, but it's going to be fully realized later. And in the interim, until it's fully realized, we go for it now with all of our hearts. But there's this tension with the kingdom at hand, realized later, right? There's also a tension with the nature of faith. And if we're, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11. And this is the chapter that, uh, you know, is, uh, lots of people call it the hall of faith. You know, there's a whole lot that is said about people who lived by faith uh, and who did things based on faith, who took steps of faith. And I mean, they saw things happen because they walked in faith. And we have this, this chapter of, of, uh, of the Bible that, that talks about faith and God honoring faith. But there is also something within the chapter of Hebrews 11 that you won't hear a lot of the word faith, word of faith preachers teach about. They'll talk about the first half of Hebrews 11, but they'll probably ignore the last half of Hebrews 11 because there's some things that are said there about the nature of faith that we can't ignore. That could be the reason why as we pursue God passionately for uh, something that we want Him to give us as a part of His kingdom, why we may not actually receive it. And so here's the truth that we're just going to begin with. And it's the nature of faith. It is the nature of faith. This is in the Bible. We have to wrestle with this. And here it is. For your notes, there will be times when believers pursue God for things on this side of heaven, on earth, right? There will be times when believers pursue God for things on this side of heaven and not receive them. The Bible teaches this. Now, most of the kingdom now theologians, the word of faith theologians, will teach you that it, it is for now, always for now, you always get it now. Or, you know, there's kind of something wrong along the way, whether it's your faith or whatever, but there's always this, this problem and you're usually to blame for it. But here in Hebrews 11, the Bible actually teaches that there are people who pursue God and they pursue God passionately like we've been talking about and they didn't receive what was promised. So although Jesus taught us to pray for an experience of heaven on earth, and he taught us to seek first his kingdom, and with all of our hearts, and Jesus taught us this, there's no doubt that we have to uh, try and, and live up to this 
passion to seek God passionately like this, um, there will be times when we don't get what we're pursuing God for. And there's a reason for it. The scriptures talk about it. It's the nature of faith. So how do I know that there will be times? Well, let's just take a look at Hebrews chapter 11. And let's begin at verse 32. This is kind of the, the closing of Hebrews 11. He's already talked about Abraham and Moses and Enoch and Jacob and, you know, all the patriarchs and uh, Rahab and just a bunch of people who saw amazing things because of faith. And then in verse 32, he kind of concludes and then, and then continues and goes on to talk about some other people. And so just follow along uh, with me, uh, beginning at verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, say through faith, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. See that? Gained what was promised. Through faith, gained what was promised. And that's the goal of seeking God, through faith to gain what is promised us. That's the goal. Uh, who shut the mouths of lions, that was Daniel, quenched the fury of flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. They gained what was promised. And then... He transitions, the writer, and it says this, Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in half. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute. Okay? Destitute. See that? The prosperity gospel? This one verse just eliminates it. These people were destitute. Why does it eliminate it? Well, let's just continue reading. They were persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. And you have to underline what is said in verse 39. Because up in verse 30, uh, 32, was it? They gained, or verse 33 near the end, they gained what was promised. Through faith, they gained what was promised. And then in verse 39, we have just read a list of people who had a bit of a tough time, right? Right? And in verse 39, underline this, this is hugely important. These, these who were sawed in two and put to death by the sword, who were destitute, who, who didn't have a home, they had to wander. Um, these were all commended for their faith. Underline that. Circle that. They were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. And then the reason why, the nature of faith. God had planned something better for us. So that only together with us would they be made complete or perfected. Okay? So I want you to notice here, <clears throat> they were commended for their faith. They were commended for their faith. We see that, right? Verse 39. The word of faith, kingdom now, theologians, if you're not getting what has been promised, they will say there's something wrong with your faith. Here the Bible is saying, no, there's nothing wrong with their faith. They were commended for their faith, even though they didn't receive what was promised. Why? Because by the nature of faith, there are going to be times when we pursue God for things on this side of heaven and we don't experience it. And the writer tells us why. And so the, the point here is, is, uh, is this. There will be times when we pursue God for His kingdom 
healing included, and not receive what we are seeking God for on this side of heaven. If this was true of believers who have gone before us, how can we expect to experience anything less? What makes us so special that we will always get what our faith is pursuing? That we will always gain, you know, by our faith? What makes us special? We're not. Other believers that the New Testament witnesses to were commended for their faith because they went for it regardless, right? They pursued passionately, regardless. They went for it. Now, let's just take a look a little further. Uh, because I want you to see in, in, in the book of Hebrews, it, it says that uh, the others were commended for their faith. Verse 13, I think it is. Oh no, verse 13 is a confirmation. Uh, some were still living by faith. When they died, they did not receive the things promised. They only welcomed them from a distance. Okay? There's another confirmation of, of sometimes not getting what you're pursuing. But when you read Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see that both of these faiths are commended. The faith that gains and the faith that pursues and doesn't gain are both commendable uh, before God. And I remember listening to a good friend of mine and uh, Matt Tapley, uh, Terry Bone, all of you know Terry Bone. Uh, Matt Tapley is, his, his, is uh, the one that uh, followed him at Lake Mount. He's still pastoring at Lake Mount. And his daughter, Sarah, passed away of cancer. And Matt even talked about in a message on faith a couple of weeks after uh, this incident happened that at one point when it was getting bad, they, they grabbed the mattress that their daughter was lying on and, and the rest of the children, his wife and his other two kids, lifted up the mattress in a prophetic symbol of just, you know, like the paralytic, raising the, the daughter up to Jesus in, in one last kind of uh, act of saying, Jesus, please come and do something. And, and they never got it. They never got it. And as Matt was sharing his experience of that, he... He pointed to Hebrews chapter 11, and he made a statement, and, uh, and so this is credit to Matt Tapley. And it was absolutely powerful. Faith that pursues and does not see the answer is not inferior to faith that pursues and does see the answer on this side of heaven. We tend to see it as inferior. Other ministers, churches, and theologians even would teach that it's inferior. But the Bible does not teach that. The Bible says that both kinds of faith, the faith that gains what's promised and the faith that doesn't gain what's promised, that goes for it, is not inferior. They're both commended before God. Now, here's the important reason why. Uh, verse 40, God had something planned that was better for us so that together with uh, us would they be made perfect right now this church is really coasting on the faithfulness of those that went before us Reverend Sherman and Geneva Miles who who planted all the Pentecostal work on the Bruce Peninsula were riding on the faith that they pursued the generation that's coming after us is going to ride the wave of the faith that we are pursuing God for and so what will it do to my children? What will it do to those that are looking to you as an example of Christian faith? Who when the going gets tough and there's obstacles and there's things that, you know, are getting in the way. If we just give up and give up on God and give up pursuing God. <clears throat> I don't want to ever give up pursuing God because I know that if I don't gain what I'm pursuing God for, that God is going to have as a reward something awesome for the generation coming up behind me. And because of that, it is my responsibility to make sure that I'm pursuing God and seeking His kingdom in the way that Jesus has taught me to. Passionately, not giving up, pursuing, asking going for it because it's going to make a difference if not in my life for those that are coming behind me 
but both types of faith are rewarded. For some reason, and I don't know necessarily, God's sovereign. His wisdom is beyond our wisdom. I don't know. But for some reason, God chooses to reward some on this side of heaven, and He chooses to reward future generations because of the faith of those who went before them. Sometimes we are pressing into God for something that in His sovereign plan, He wishes to pour out on a future generation. And for this reason, we should not stop pursuing uh, God. Both kinds of faith are rewarded. But that's, that's the nature of faith. It's the nature of faith. Uh, some, there are some things that God wants to do in your children's lives and in your grandchildren's lives that are going to be the result of your pursuit of faith. Not theirs, your pursuit. It's going to give them a foundation to rise up onto. And if you give up, you take away that foundation. And then you teach them to give up too, right? If you set the example of, I didn't get it, and I'm angry with God, and frustrated with God, and I'm giving up on God, and guess what? You teach the generation coming up behind us. It's, it's not good. But it's the nature of faith. We have to wrestle with it. Some gain, and some don't gain. Some won't gain what is promised. It's in the Bible, so we have to, uh, have to deal with it. Uh, the next lesson we're actually going to begin to tackle... Um, hindrances that can get in the way of God's kingdom being established. Things that we can uh, actually work on. <laughs> if God chooses to reward the generation that's coming behind us, not a whole lot we can do about that in His sovereignty. He can choose to delay something because He has a, a purpose for the generation behind us. But there are things that we can be responsible for to make sure that we get out of our lives and clear from our hearts and lives so that the kingdom of God has a direct access to our hearts without hindrances. And that will be the, uh, the subject of lesson number six, hindrances to receiving.